All right, you know they say they say step into my tea parlor. So I just did that. <laughs> All right, so we're at the fancy food show. We're uh, where are we? What aisle are we at? We're at aisle forty seven hundred. We're with Ned Hegarty, right? Did I say it right? Correct. Oh, Ned cool. Hegarty, Silk Road Teas. Silk Road Teas from San Rafael, California. IA. Correct. All righty. Correct. And so, so are you the tea meister? Well, yeah, I've been in tea for 17 years now. I travel in China every year, and I buy tea, source tea in the early spring, high-end specialty teas from China. All right. What what makes a good tea? First and foremost, good soil. Okay. Uh, that like makes many sense. things, it's an agricultural product, and then you need the farmer to take care of that plant, put in the nutrition, and then it's the pluck. What time? It's timing. Is the weather been warm? Lots of uh, amino acids flowing through up in those things. Everyone wants to procreate, so you want to get those leaves that are busting out for procreation. Pluck those and then handle it very carefully. Okay. So we're looking at, we're, these are tea leaves right here, right? That's correct. All right. So what, what do we see in these tea leaves for the untrained eyes, such as mine? What, what makes this a, a really cool tea? Like, this is... This is what kind of teas are we looking at? Well, you're looking at on this one side here is a wonderful white tea from an area called Fuding in, in Fujian province. And this is a very early spring tea. And for your listeners, what we're looking at, it looks very much like a salad mix. It's it beautiful does. Yeah. white green leaf with some silver in there. Those are unopened buds. So you have a, it's a beautiful blend of green leaf and silver bud. Okay. And then on the second uh, basket here, we have a very deep light green with some more bluish colored looking. And that's a rolled oolong called Ti Kuan Yen. And that's a high mountain oolong from the coast of China, again, along Fujian uh, province, along the China Sea. And this tea is very floral, opens up to a quite large leaf, and it's a priced tea in China. Right. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that looks like a salad, and that looks like raisins. Right. You know, it's right. The eye. Well, that's the thing. In China, what you see there is that that's going to give you a certain kind of taste profile, right? Right. That's going to be very mouthfulling. And this one's been rolled and worked quite extensively, and it's actually halfway oxidized, where that's not oxidized at all. And this one is semi-oxidized. So. Now, what does oxidation do? And I thought, you know, you don't want to have, you always want to have antioxidants in your, your... Okay, so what you've got there is that's just the interplay of air on the leaf. Okay. The longer the leaf is exposed to the air, the darker it becomes. So when you imagine this, this white tea you and I are looking at right now is considered white and it's quite green. If they just left that leaf alone, tomorrow morning it would be a black tea. Oh. Uh, it's just letting the air play on the surface of the leaf. It turns increasingly dark. This is the oolong tea is equidistant between white and black tea. It's semi-oxidized. Black tea would be next to this and be black. So it's just let it play with air. So that's mid station. That's okay. mid station. Now I noticed that you guys use a certain kind of tea bag. It's not you know the usual commercial thing. That's correct. This is, so I, I noticed that. Could you tell me about the tea bag? Because I think that. Probably at least to the untrained palate and eye that I have, that probably has a lot to do with getting the taste to really come out in, a, in an authentic way. That's correct. And, and yeah, there's, there's two things at play there. One is to protect the, the subtle uh, taste, the notes of the tea, by not letting it be interrupted by paper or any sort of or taste. Chemicals. Of chemicals, yeah, yeah. exactly. And then the second factor is what we try and do is put our product in. That's a, a spun cornstarch, non-GMO cornstarch that's spun into a silken thread to create a pouch that's tasteless and biodegradable. So we and it, and it can expand. It's that's called a pyramid style. So it can expand and let the leaf totally relax and release its flavors. Right. At different times of the day, is it appropriate to have a different kind of tea? Most certainly. Okay, so let's talk, like, what's a good morning tea? What's a good afternoon tea? What's a good nightcap tea? Well, I think you always... Because I'm going to be drinking tea all day long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's a good strategy because I think the black tea is kind of satisfying because you want a lot of body. You want something to help wake up, and you're looking for somebody to sort of nurture and make you feel. Black tea should make you feel not only awake but warmer. And then as the day progresses, let's say a gentleman like you... It's working. It doesn't really need his body anymore, but he needs to be mentally alert. Oolong tea is a beautiful selection because it's very active up in the hypocanthus area of the brain. So you get a lot of brain activity without the agitation in the body. 
The other thing is caffeine in a tea like oolong is slow release. So it's you're getting a little bit at a time versus the large hit of a coffee, for example. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then as you move into the afternoon, you have two choices. You can do what's called a tisane or an herbal like that three flower celebration which is a blend of of chrysanthemum lavender and rosebuds oh lavender makes you sleepy yeah it's very common yeah yeah, and it also no caffeine so it's a nice it hydrates you and it keeps you going or black tea is very refreshing so maybe a little black tea as you get to two or three in the afternoon and you're flagging a little bit a black tea or green tea refreshes you wow now during the colder months does that strategy change compared to the summer or hotter months? Yeah, I think it does. You know, you know that you you might want something a little more bold and strong, like a really strong Yunnan black tea in the winter, right. kind of buck you up and keep you going. And you're probably going to lighten up, maybe going to a jasmine or even a white tea in the summer. And all of them are delicious, just just uh, chilling them, putting them in your refrigerator, let them cool down, and drink them as iced tea. They're delicious. I happen to be a big fan of iced tea. Yeah, well, back here you need it. I mean, <laughs> judging by this weather, you need something like that. So how did you become a tea guy? Well, I was introduced to a fellow who had done extensive travel and started this business in China. He was really the first person to go into China and source specialty unblended teas. And he and I became friends and over a couple of years negotiated and worked together in China and then he wanted to sell the company so I bought the company from him and that was 17 years ago and I travel every year the same model we travel in China and buy from small farms now what latitude on the earth is the ideal tea growing climate like obviously it's not the equator it's not the north pole or south pole so where where it would be like halfway up two thirds you know well, the coast of China, imagine that, which is more or less right across the, what, from San Francisco, just head to east. the east. Just go east. from Yeah. There. And you want, what you want for great tea is you want to be at least 800 feet in elevation, right up through 1600. And your higher grades of tea are going to be higher up the slope. And what you want is a very warm, kind of humid day, lots of sun, and then a temperature that drops down into the maybe the you know low 60s into the 50s at night so that contrast up and down creates wonderful flavors and aromas so what is what is the 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 plant look like you know just describe it because obviously it's the leaf yeah that you care about and how do you harvest the leaf without damaging the plant so you can yield more tea for the year after yeah it's critical well it's camellia sinensis is the base plant is the species that all tea emanates from. And it looks a little bit like your camellia that you have here in the United States, the very dark serrated leaf with the pink or the red flowers on it. It's, it's thinner, it's, and it's, it's got a beautiful serration. Uh, and what you want to do is let it grow to about three to four feet tall so it's very easy to pluck. That's what you do when you, when you harvest tea. You pluck with your middle finger and your thumb and you pluck the bud. High-grade teas pluck that way and put it in a basket and then on you go eventually to your teacup. So it's a, and the rows are cut with, and they usually hug right along very steep slopes of the mountains for high-grade teas. So I have to ask a question. Have you actually gone out into the field at the farm level, like with a pot of boiling water, <laughs> plucked the tea, and made the tea right on the spot? Yes, we have. And what is it like compared to anything else? It's a bit bitter, astringent, because it hasn't been worked at all. Uh, you really need to do a little bit of work on it. You need to oxidize it to kind of calm it down. Right there, it's delicious, but it's what we call mao cha. It's raw tea, mao cha. And so it's a bit astringent or pungent, pungent so, to be the That's word. interesting because, you know, you'd think like when you have an apple or a piece of fruit, you get it right from the, you know, from the or- orchard. And you bite, you're like, wow, it's the peak of flavor. And, and here, it, you don't want necessarily the peak of flavor. You need the peak of perfection. A yeah. little different, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, but on China's side, they, they do prize that mao cha. And, you know, it's all in what you're looking for. Tea people, 
I think the beauty of tea is that it offers you such a wide range of flavors. It does. Yeah. You may like coffee. Yeah. Because coffee's kind of like coffee. Yeah. 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 And like you no said, no disrespect earlier, to the coffee people. Yeah. <laughs> what's good in the morning? What's good midday? It's that same thing. Tea can really fit your mood. What do I have in my cupboard? Oh, I feel like this, and there's usually something to fit the mood. Now, is there a proper way to, you know, to to, to make the tea? And is there a proper way to pour it and to have it sit? Like, you know, we're, and, you know, we're kind of like hacks here. You know, we, we have these machines and microwaves, yeah. and we take everything that's sort of natural and beautiful, and we nuke it, and we put it in styrofoam cups, which is bad for the environment, or, and we eat it in, or, and we eat it in paper cups, which probably has some kind of chemicals in it or whatever, or we drink things with straws that don't allow the whole tongue right. to experience the taste because we have a straw, which is not like bad for the environment, but it only concentrates the flavor like, like on the target area that hits the tongue. So what's, what's the right way? You know, there's only one way to rock, like Sammy Hagar says. <laughs> what's the right way to drink, to prepare and make a proper cup of tea? Well, what's most critical, I think, for most people is the water. Uh, if you've bought a good tea, it's got flavors that you want to enjoy. So you don't want to have fluorides in there. You want to have a good quality water. So like spring water is critical. If you can get, or at least filter it, a Breda, some sort of filtration system. So the water's pretty much benign, but best with some mineral if it does, because it's complementary to tea. And then you get, with that, you'll get amino acids and minerals and flavors and aromas that are unencumbered. They're not being masked. But from there, it's very simple. You want to just get your water warm, just sort of boiling, typical. A teaspoonful of, uh, of good leaf into a teapot. Pour the hot water on. I would recommend a two to three minute steep and taste. See if, it, if you like it stronger. Let it go a little longer. And then once you get a little familiar, you learn what's your sweet spot. Oh, three minutes is where I like it. And it becomes intuitive for you. When you get up in the morning and you're shuffling around the kitchen, you know when three minutes and you pour your cup and it tastes just like you like. It's very simple. So when you're on the road, do you carry your own stuff? So in case you don't have to get, you know, <laughs> you nasty know coffee or anything. You, know you know it. There's you have like a little, little, little secret part, yeah, like yeah. secret compartment with a knapsack, the you, briefcase. You got to do that. If you love tea, you got to pack your own. You don't want to be at the peril of the, of the hotel room. No way. Well, I, thank you for the, 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 the great information. A pleasure to meet you. We'll get a picture at the end. And uh, for all out there, Silk Road Tea. And where do they go and find you? Where do they look you up? www.silkroadteas.com. We're in San Rafael, California. And, yeah, we ship all over the United States. We have a wonderful selection of high-grade specialty teas. And if he's out of the office, he may be picking tea in China. <laughs> <laughs>